There's a museum in Peterborough that's home to hundreds of thousands of artefacts from throughout history, with exhibits spanning from fossils of prehistoric marine life to even an actual Roman soldier's sword. Which, that alone just sounds so interesting, but that doesn't even come close to what the building is also known for. Because Peterborough Museum and Art Gallery is rumoured to be the most haunted building in the city. People have seen figures, heard disembodied voices, random footsteps, unexplained bangs, and even some visitors say that they've been physically pushed by some they can't see. Some people have been so genuinely terrified that they refuse to set foot in certain areas of the museum, but others have straight up vowed never to return at all because the building just makes them feel so uneasy. So what's going on inside this museum? Why are so many people reporting these terrifying encounters? And if these reports are to be believed, who could be responsible for all of this paranormal activity? So before we dive into all of the ghost sightings, and trust me, there are a lot, we gotta rewind a little bit. Well, a lot of it. Because like most haunted places, the story starts way back, centuries ago. Because the earliest known building on this site dates back to the 16th century. And if you know your architectural styles, you'll know that that's not the building that's standing there today. But the house that used to be at this location in Peterborough, called Neville Place, was built by the Orme family sometime after 1536. And the Ormes, they were a big deal. Humphrey Orme, the head of the family, he was actually part of King Henry VIII's court. So super high up, super powerful, super well connected. So obviously they needed a house to reflect that. This huge Tudor Manor house, Neville Place, became the family seat and it was passed down through the generations of Orms, even through the English Civil War, with the Orms being staunch royalists, i.e. being on the wrong side of the war, they managed to keep hold of their great big family home. Although they did pay heavily for this. When the parliamentarians won the war and signed King Charles I's death warrant in 1649, the Orm family, just like so many other royalist sympathiser families, families up and down the country were slapped with heavy fines. Sir Humphrey Orme's tomb, which was waiting for him in Peterborough Cathedral, that was vandalised too by parliamentary troops when they sacked the place in 1643, and after that he decided not to bother her with it and ended up being buried elsewhere anyway. So overall, the English Civil War was just not a good time for the Orms. But like I said before, this is a powerful family. They were members of parliament, magistrates, and fun side note, also responsible for building the Guild Hall in Cathedral Square. By the early 19th century though, times were a change in. In 1815, a prominent businessman called Thomas Cook comes onto the scene, and not the travel agent Thomas Cook, a different guy, although around the same-ish sort of time. He'd met his first wife Julia in London, and then moved up to Peterborough to start a family, of which one could say mission accomplished. They had 10 children that survived into adulthood. Initially, Thomas was just leasing this house from the Orms before he bought it outright. And once it was all his, you haven't got the landlord breathing down your neck for the slightest bit of sellotape damage to the wall. He decided it was time to turn this house into a home, really put his own stamp on it, make it his. The Tudor Mansion thing? So overdone. In 1816, he actually demolished pretty much the entire house that the Orms had built, leaving only a couple of walls still standing, and also the cellars underground. He then rebuilt it in this Grand Georgian style, which was very befitting for a man of his status at the time. And it's this building that we can still see today. Just a year later though, in 1817, Julia passed away just days after her 42nd birthday. But Thomas wasted absolutely no time. I mean, he's got 10 kids. The eldest isn't of age to marry off yet, and the youngest is just a toddler, like, he can't cope with all of that. So just two years later, he was married to a woman called Charlotte Squire. And she came from a prominent family, so for all intents and purposes, this was great. Until it quite quickly became clear that it wasn't. Because just two more years after that, Thomas was filing to have the marriage annulled, not a full-on getting divorced. On the grounds that after a physical examination, Charlotte was unable to bear children. The guy already had 10 kids, so getting a marriage annulled because she couldn't have children seems a bit sus. And so I'm pretty sure it's got absolutely nothing to do with the fact that Thomas's eldest daughter, once she was eligible to marry, had married William Squire, Charlotte's older brother, making Charlotte both her stepmother and sister-in-law, being only a couple of years older than Julia, the daughter herself. Not exactly riding off into the sunset here. There was talk that after the annulment, Charlotte moved into the Dower House, which was a house Thomas had built next door to the big mansion on Priestgate, but that doesn't seem to have been the case. Thomas did then go on to marry two more times though, until he eventually passed away in 1854. The house stood vacant after Thomas's death, which I thought was quite strange that none of the 10 kids would have took it on, but there you go. But then in 1856, the building was acquired by Earl Fitzwilliam on behalf of the Infirmary Trust. Because Peterborough, as a city, is obviously still expanding, still growing, there is still a need for proper healthcare instead of just lodging houses and dispensaries. And so in 1857, the city's first hospital, Peterborough Infirmary, opened up in Thomas Cook's old house. In the 1860s, a fever hospital was opened up too, just to the back of the main building. And a fever hospital is basically just 
an area separate to the main hospital where patients suffering from infectious diseases can be pretty much quarantined while they're being treated for things like scarlet fever, tuberculosis, and smallpox. I know back then they don't actually have cures, antibiotics were a long way off, but they did what they could. It was run as a charity hospital, caring for the sick and injured, but it wasn't all smooth sailing, of course. There was a huge fire that ripped through the upper floors on the 9th of May, 1884. The entire hospital had to be evacuated. Luckily, I don't think anyone was hurt, all of the staff and patients were accounted for, but it caused major damage that took months to repair. As years went on though, the city, continuing to grow with more demand on resources across the board, meant that Peterborough needed a bigger, fancier hospital to keep up with that demand, not to mention medical advancements that were going on and all of that. And so in 1928, they opened a brand new one, the War Memorial Hospital, which took over completely from the infirmary at Priestgate. And so once again, the building finds itself vacant, but it wasn't long before it had another new job. Sir Percy Malcolm Stewart was the chairman of the London Brick Company, which is exactly as described, the company makes bricks. But buildings need bricks, you know, so there's a lot of money to be made there. He was, by all accounts though, a decent man, a philanthropist, if you will. And so he bought the building and donated it to the Peterborough Museum Society so they would have a permanent home for their collections. And by 1931, they were ready to open their doors to the public to allow them to come and have a look around all of the interesting bits and bobs that they had on display. So they had the exhibit set up on the ground floor of the first floor, but what did they do with the top floor? You'll, you'll never guess. They rented it out to a potato merchant. Yeah, potato merchant, of all things. And look, I'm not knocking this at all. It was a really smart move on the museum's part, as the potato merchant's rent actually helped to pay for the running of the museum, covering the wages of one full-time live-in employee, a caretaker. And from here, the museum was a success. Eventually, they took over the top floor too, taking it back from the potato guy and filling it with more exhibits, until 1968, when it was handed over to the Peterborough City Council. Viva City, the city's culture trust, took on the museum in May 2010, and that brings us all the way up to date. And now there are hundreds of thousands of artifacts that you can go and have a look around, loads of fossils that have been found in the area, other archaeological discoveries, there's a Victorian operating theatre left over from its time as an infirmary, just loads of things going on. But the thing about having such a historical place that is then packed with all that history, fossils and leftover bits from the hospital days, is it doesn't appear to be just artifacts that seem to have stuck around. Because people have been witnessing strange things going on inside this museum for years. In fact, the very first recorded ghost sighting came from none other than the wife of the museum's first caretaker in the 1930s, who was actually documented in a local newspaper. So the museum had only been open for a few weeks at this point, and the caretaker was a Mr Yarrow, who had moved in with his wife and two kids. One day, must have been a slow day, Mr Yarrow went out and took the kids, leaving Mrs Yarrow to hang around for all the guests to leave so that she could lock up. Once everyone had gone and she'd locked the doors, she went back up to their flat on the first floor to start making dinner, when she started hearing someone out on the main staircase. Naturally, she just assumed that it was her other half and the kids coming home, so she went out to greet them. It was not. She goes out to the stairs to see a man, seeming to be in his 30s, wearing a grey uniform, and he's moving up the stairs. Notice how I don't say climbing. Mrs Yarrow says that this man's footsteps were booming, they were unnaturally loud, but he wasn't walking one foot in front of the other up each step. He was gliding up the stairs. And as if that wasn't enough, he also apparently had an almost phosphorescent glow to him, like someone had accidentally dipped him in glow-in-the-dark paint or something. Very strange. Mrs Yarrow was just rooted to the spot, couldn't really believe what she was seeing when the figure reached the landing in front of her. He carried on walking slash gliding to the doors, walked through them, not concerning himself with any trivial detail like opening them or anything, where he just then disappeared. Well, that was that. Mrs Yarrow noped so hard out of that whole situation and just legged it all the way out of the building, refusing to go back inside until Mr Yarrow and the kids came back. And apparently she wasn't the only one to spot him though. This figure has been seen over and over again. One of their kids, she apparently saw him several times over the years. And while Mrs Yarrow's account was the first one reported in a newspaper, printed in 1932, there was talk that the nurses working in the infirmary, so pre-1928, they also allegedly spotted him once or twice. But sightings of him have continued over the years. In one particularly terrifying account, when Andrew Stainton Roberts, a museum officer who's been there for over 25 years, he'd brought his then young daughter into work. I think she was like five years old or something at the time. They were all just there, casually eating lunch in the staff room, when the little girl piped up and asked her parents, can I give some of my sandwich to the soldier in grey standing in the corner? He looks hungry. Immediately, her parents look at each other like, we've never told you the story of the soldier, we didn't want to traumatise you, like how on earth have you heard this ghost story? But they just play it cool, replying with, yeah, sure, go ahead. To which she replied, oh, never mind, he's gone now. Don't worry, it gets even weirder. A bit later that day, this little girl is running around the gift shop when she spots a book for sale which had a picture of this soldier connected to the building on the front cover. Immediately, she stops and recognises 
recognises him as the man in grey who was standing in the corner looking hungry. By far though, if you're gonna come across this man in grey, you're most likely to see him around those main stairs. One night there was a museum officer locking up and she was going about it logically, starting at the top floor and working her way down. As she got to the ground floor though, she just so happened to glance up the stairs to see the ghostly white face of a man standing at the top of the staircase, staring down at her. Whether that's a real person or a ghost, that would just terrify me. Luckily she was a bit more level-headed than I would be and so she just assumed, oh, I've just locked someone in. So she went all the way up to the top of the stairs to bring them down and let them out. When she got up there, there of course was not a single living soul to be seen. A few months later, an electrician was waiting at the top of the stairs when just out of the corner of his eye, he saw a man in grey walk past. But when he turned to look, there was no one there. And just to round off a particularly active year for this man in grey, a couple of months after that, another electrician was waiting around the staircase. This time he was at the bottom of the stairs when he saw the figure of a man in grey materialise halfway up the stairs, where he then proceeded to glide up the rest of the staircase before disappearing completely. So I don't know what was going on around 2005, he seems to have been spotted quite a bit, but it's said that this man will usually be seen around July, August time, and there's allegedly a very good reason for this, because this figure is apparently Sergeant Thomas Hunter, also known as the Lonely Anzac, and his story is just tragic, honestly. Sergeant Hunter was born in Newcastle on the 5th of May 1880, but by 1910 he decided to pack up and emigrate to Australia at the age of 30, where he'd ended up in New South Wales in a town called Curry Curry, where he worked as a coal miner. Fast forward to 1914 and the First World War breaks out. Of course, Hunter, wanting to do his bit, he enlists in the Australian Army. He served in the 10th Battalion of the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps, fighting at Gallipoli and on the Western Front, which if you know anything about World War One, you'll know those were brutal places to find yourself. In June of 1916, during the Battle of the Somme, Sergeant Hunter was seriously wounded and ended up with several bullets lodged in his spine. He was treated in a field hospital, they did as much as they could, but clearly he needed more specialised care, ASAP. So they shipped him back to Britain for surgery. He arrived in Portsmouth and he was put on a train heading north to Halifax where they would be able to operate on him, but it wasn't looking good. According to reports, there was this unmistakable sweet smell filling the train carriage. It was the smell of gangrene because his condition was just getting worse and worse. The medical staff on board the train realised he ain't gonna make it to Halifax, so they asked the train driver to stop at the nearest station, and that's how Sergeant Thomas Hunter ended up in Peterborough. The train stopped and he was taken to the nearest hospital, which was the infirmary, now the site of the museum. They did what they could for him, but in reality it was too late. Sergeant Hunter passed away in the building on the 31st of July, 1916. Even though he was thousands of miles away from home, Peterborough made sure that he wasn't forgotten. He was buried with full military honours in Broadway Cemetery, and over 2,000 local people came together to help erect a memorial for him. And that's why they call him the Lonely Anzac, because he died so far away from home. And to this day, over a century later, Sergeant Hunter is still honoured on the 25th of April, Anzac Day. However, despite his honourable burial and the respect he's shown by the community, the reports coming out of Peterborough Museum seem to suggest that maybe Sergeant Hunter hasn't fully moved on. And maybe that's why he's seen around that July-August time, around the time when he passed away. And so while he's probably the most famous ghost at the museum, he's far from the only one, even just from its hospital days, said to still be lingering around. A woman wearing a Victorian nurse's uniform has also been seen in the building, as well as doctors and even apparently patients on various occasions. And even some people have claimed to be hit with that unmistakable smell of hospitals. You know that really strong disinfectant antiseptic smell? Even though it's been a long time since the museum would have been scrubbed with those sorts of chemicals. Not beyond the realms of imagination for some remnants to still be left over I guess, but thought I'd mention it anyway. But the most interesting story for me was from a woman who was interviewed by Stuart Orme, who worked in the museum for years and wrote the book Haunted Peterborough. And this woman actually grew up in the museum, her dad was the caretaker in the 1940s, so she would have lived in that caretaker's flat. One day she was laid up in bed with chickenpox and the doctor had been sent for. She's drifting in and out of sleep, like you know, you've got the fever, you're in bed, you're not really there with it. She wakes up to see the doctor standing at the foot of her bed. He looked super kind, didn't say anything, just stood there checking her over for a few minutes before he turned and left. So she just drifted back into sleep. Not too long after, she was woken up by another doctor walking into the room, at which point she did think it was strange, like why am I being checked over by two doctors? Again, didn't think a great deal of it. That was until a few weeks later when she was fully recovered and helping her dad with some old photos at the museum, where she saw one photo showing that first doctor who had been standing at the foot of her bed. Turns out it was a Dr. Alfred Caleb Taylor, but he had died in 1927, long before this little girl had even moved into the museum. But this Dr. Taylor, he had been a medical man working at the hospital and he was actually one of the first people to pioneer the new x-ray technology. 
technology, which is brilliant, advancements in medical science and all of that, but it had cost him his life, as he had died of radiation poisoning from his work with the hospital's x-ray machine. And so now it seemed like he was still there in the building, looking out for patients as best he could. But there's so much more reported to be going on here. Over in what used to be the men's ward, the geology gallery, which, as a side note, would have probably been the room where Sergeant Hunter likely spent his final few moments before passing away, you could encounter something else that's potentially otherworldly in here. Because it's said that this particular room is haunted by a little girl. Apparently she's very rarely seen, she is most often heard. You might hear her chatting away to herself when you know for a fact that there aren't any kids about. But one of the most unsettling encounters I came across was in December 2008, when a workman did actually see something. He was up a ladder fixing some wiring, you know, as you do, regular day on the job, when he just so happened to hear a weird noise coming from the end of the corridor, where there was a set of doors with frosted glass windows. He looks over, trying to see what's going on, when he sees a little girl walking from one side of the glass to the other. This was during the cold light of day, and there was a school trip at the museum at that point, so he just naturally assumed that a kid had wandered off. So he got down from the ladder to see if he could help her. He got to the doors and opened them, to see that there was absolutely no one on the other side of them. The only thing through those doors was a cupboard. Nowhere for that little girl who we had most definitely seen to have gone. So what had he seen? Clearly it wasn't a living little girl. We don't know who this little girl could be though. Maybe she was one of the children who would have grown up here while the building was a private house, as there are a couple of hauntings that are said to date back to this time. Because while it's now a museum and previously it was a hospital, there are still clues to its more domestic past, if you know where to look. Particularly in one section of the museum, which I now think is like a private staff only area, which ironically enough was exactly what it was used for back when the building was a private house too, would have been the servants quarters. The ceilings are lower, the rooms are smaller, the corridor is super narrow, it's just got a whole different vibe from the rest of the museum. And the house staff would have also had their own staircase, so they would have been able to move around out of sight of the family. And this back staircase is said to be haunted by a female servant who allegedly fell to her death on these very stairs. The story goes that this female servant had attracted the attention of one of the men in the house, whether it was a gentleman in the family or a male servant, either way, she wasn't interested. The man at some point decided that he was done trying to win her affections and instead just had his way with her and she fell pregnant. Not too long after that, this woman was found dead at the bottom of these stairs. No one really knows how she fell. Did she slip and it was a totally innocent accident? Did she jump, not wanting to face the shame of having a child out of wedlock? Or was she pushed by the father of the baby, not wanting a scandal in the household? We don't know. As far as I can tell, there isn't any evidence out there to say who this woman could be, whether a servant did die this way or anything like that. But now people report really weird things happening on these stairs and and it's usually women who experience them. They might feel an overwhelming sense of unease or feel actually physically unwell in that area. Some have heard a disembodied female voice and others say that they felt someone brush past them. Like someone maybe wearing an old fashioned dress is right there, even though there's no one else in sight. But some women have claimed to have an even more unsettling experience. Some have actually felt hands on their back, reasonably gently, but not in the, hey, I'm just letting you know I'm here kind of way. More like, let me help you down these stairs quickly, Kind of way. But looking at the whole thing rationally, it is an old staircase, it does lean slightly too, could that be messing with your equilibrium? Maybe that could have something to do with it, but I'm not really sure that completely explains away the feeling of hands on your back, you know? So while the female servant is said to haunt the back staircase, there is allegedly another lady of the house who prefers a much more elegant setting for her haunting. It's apparently Charlotte Cook, the second wife of Thomas, the guy who built the house, and she is said to haunt the main staircase. Her presence has been picked up by mediums over the years, but other people have also, again, heard disembodied female voices in that area. And there was this one story, and honestly, it just sounds wild. There was a paranormal investigation going on back in 2003, and there were a couple sitting on the top of the stairs, like calling out and whatnot, when all of a sudden, from below them on the stairs, they heard something. It was the unmistakable sound of someone walking down the stairs, step by step, accompanied by the rustling of a silk dress. That wasn't all. Right after that, they heard someone calling out, clear as day, Lady Charlotte, Lady Charlotte, multiple times as if they're trying to get Charlotte's attention. Now that on its own, that's pretty incredible, but it gets even better. As the night carried on and everyone went back to base and were comparing notes about what they'd experienced during the night, that couple found out that there was another group of investigators standing still at the bottom of the stairs and had heard exactly the same thing. The footsteps, the dress rustling, the woman calling out. Neither group had known that the other was hearing the same noises, and yet they all experienced it in real time from two completely different spots. But surely, right? If it did shake out that way, that indicates 
that someone else is haunting the staircase too. I don't think Charlotte Cook would go around shouting her own name, right? But either way, very interesting. It's not just hauntings attached to the building itself. Sometimes it seems like entities may have moved in along with the artifacts that have been put on display in the museum, because apparently there is a ghostly Roman soldier who has been seen in the gallery opposite the geology room, as he seems to be attached to a Roman sword that's on display here. People have seen a dark male figure standing in front of the display case where the sword is kept, almost like he's checking on it. One witness said that they watched him look into the case and then he just casually turned and walked away, except he didn't walk very far because he completely disappeared. One second he's there and then the next just completely dematerialised. Sometimes when you're around the sword, people often get this unshakable feeling that they're being watched, as if the owner is guarding the sword, even in the afterlife. And even after you've finished looking at the sword and you've moved on, you might feel this urge to just leave the room, almost as if someone is there telling you, okay, time's up, move along, next room now. And if you don't get the feeling like you've outstayed you're welcome in this room. Sometimes you might hear the sounds of monks chanting during the day. And there's no pre-recorded music playing, nothing like that, no reason to be hearing that at all, which is just very odd. While some of these entities seem to just exist in this museum, not all of them are quite so passive. There's one presence that feels darker. Visitors and staff have reported a male figure lurking in the old-fashioned recreation of a shop front. And by the sounds of it, you don't want to run into him on your own. First of all, this is already the darkest part of the museum. No natural light and barely any artificial lighting, so there's that going on. But then you add in that extra little otherworldly detail that puts you on edge, making this atmosphere in here just not surprising that some people get so freaked out that they can't stay in this area, they need to get out. There was a story from 2004, and I just feel so sorry for this little kid, right? There was a young boy and his mom, and they used to regularly go to the museum where they'd go to this area with the shop front. Just looking at the different products and things that you used to be able to buy, they'd have a great time. One day, this little boy ran ahead out of sight of his mom, he was super excited to get to the shop, until all his mum heard was this blood-curdling scream. He was completely inconsolable. His mum obviously rushed over to him, but she could not get him to calm down. All he kept saying was, there's a nasty man in there. Naturally, the museum staff were a bit like, uh, okay, let's check this out. They looked around the area, they checked the CCTV just to make sure there wasn't some actual creepy guy wandering around, but there was nothing. No man, no one at all. The room was completely empty, except for this kid who had been terrified out of his mind by something no one else could see. People have also reported weird light anomalies in this area, footsteps have been heard when there's no one walking, and some people have even claimed that they were poked by something. When they turn around, there's no one there. And there is another one of your more classic hauntings, there is also a ghost known as the White Lady, said to be haunting the top floor. She's usually spotted in broad daylight, usually on quiet days when there's not that many people around. We don't actually know who she is or why she's still here, but what we do know is that based on what witnesses have claimed, she likes to follow people around. She appear behind you, staring at you until you notice her, and then she disappears in the blink of an eye. Okay, see her once, that's easy to put down to maybe just your imagination. But then you'll move a bit further down the gallery, look at a different display, and there she is again, standing right behind you. I don't think I'm super comfortable with that, mysterious lady. Thank you, but no. But back downstairs now, and there is a little room that is used as kind of like a mini classroom for school trips and things. Sometimes when staff open up in the morning, they find that furniture that was laid out before they locked up for the night has been been mysteriously moved around. One specific example was they put out those like mini kid chairs around some of the tables and they'd arrange the chairs so one side of the table was blue and the other side was red. And when they'd come in in the morning, the chairs had been switched around so they went blue, red, blue, red all the way around the table. No explanation, no one had been in that room since they locked up the night before and it's thought that a ghostly caretaker is behind this. Apparently he's been spotted a few times, usually appearing as an older man, maybe in his 50s, stooped over with a big old keychain jangling on on his belt. Classic caretaker. And while we don't know specifically which caretaker this is, I love the thought that he's still out here doing his job, even after death. Kind of like, oh you thought I was off the payroll, I think again, these chairs aren't lined up right. <laughs> but if all of those ghost stories aren't enough for you, it's time to go down underground into the cellars known as the Priestgate Vaults. Because it wouldn't be a haunted museum if there wasn't at least one ghost in the cellar. This area usually isn't open to the public, but you can get down there on ghost tours and investigations and things. And I haven't been yet, but I would say it's worth worth booking onto a tour where you get to go down underground. Because like I said earlier, this is the part of the building that dates back to the original Tudor house that was on this site. That alone is cool enough to just go and have a look at. So much so that you can even apparently see an old window frame from the 16th century. And I might be giving away just how nerdy I am for history, but I would say that that is cool enough alone without all of the ghosts to go down on a tour into the cellars. And so during the time of the Ormond Cook families, this area would have been used for storage. Things like coal, wine, and then a little bit later on during the time of the hospital, 
even bodies. Because before the infirmary had an official morgue, they needed a cool place to store patients who had passed away during the summer months, and the cellar was perfect for this. And I mean, with that much history crammed into one place, underground no less, it's no wonder that things got a little haunted. In the mid 80s, workmen were down there putting in a new security system when they reported hearing voices and footsteps, even though they knew that there was no one else around. And this poor guy in 2001, he was just there to read the meter, right? Lucky for him, it was down in the cellar, so off he went on his own. And it wasn't long before he came straight back up, white as a sheet, absolutely terrified, saying that there was something down there with me. Doors have been known to slam on their own, stones and things have been thrown around, and a couple of actual apparitions have allegedly been seen. There's another hallmark of a haunted house here, that of a hooded monk, who was seen in a darkened doorway before slowly fading away. And some people think that this might have been a Catholic priest from the time of the Orm family, as maybe there were one or two Orms who continued to practice Catholicism, even after it was outlawed in the 16th century. <laughs> While seeing dark shadows appear and slowly disappear in a doorway would most likely send me running out of the nearest fire escape, he is not the worst entity down here. As there's also a scruffy looking servant seen down in the cellar, who people have lovingly nicknamed Baldrick, but the affection doesn't seem to be reciprocated. People report feeling the vibe like they're extremely unwelcome, they're intruding on his territory, and he's been seen sitting in the corner of the wine cellar, scowling. But it does really seem like no matter where you go in Peterborough Museum, activity has been reported. Some people have been pushed with so much force that they've fallen to the ground. Some have heard their names called out loud and clear when there's no one around. And a lot of people say that there are certain rooms that they refuse to set foot in. The operating room is a big culprit for that. But others say that they will never return to the museum. The vibe that they got was just super off. Some even got headaches. They just never want to come back because of something that they experienced here. But if you made it out of the museum unscathed, don't think you're safe just yet. Because the car park behind the museum used to be the site of the hospital's mortuary. And after that closed, it was used as a scout hut. But apparently scout leaders would hate doing overnight sleepovers, as they would never get a good night's sleep. Now that the old mortuary building isn't there anymore, people coming back to their cars have reported being touched on the shoulder, and others have even seen a white figure wandering around the area. So whether it's footsteps, whispers, or even physical contact, it seems like Peterborough Museum is a haunted house wrapped in a history lesson. But what would you do if you came face to face with a ghostly man in a grey soldier's uniform? Well, you were pushed to the ground by something you can't see. Now these are quite extreme examples, and by extension of that, extremely rare, but it's interesting, isn't it? And so I will say I highly recommend Stuart Orme's book, Haunted Peterborough. He spent years working at the museum, he had his own experiences there, it was such a fascinating insight, so definitely give that one a go. And I fully believe that this place is haunted, there are just too many stories, and too much history, centuries old houses, and a hospital, and all of that death that comes along with that. Practically a neon sign overhead saying, ghosts live here. <laughs> no, but you know what I mean. Even if the stories have been exaggerated over time or whatnot, not escaping the fact that they also do make money from the ghost stories in the form of ghost tours, so the paranormal is in their interests, it is still a lot, experienced by a lot of people over a long time, so I do think that there is something to it. But let me know what you think, and if you enjoyed this story please do give the video a like, and if you haven't already it'd be super cool to have you around, so if you wanted to subscribe too that would be awesome. But anyway, that is all from me today, I cannot wait to chat with you more about the morbid, mysterious and macabre, so until next time, sleep safe. There's that much cat hair flying about, I get it in my eyes, and now there's a bit in my eyes yet again. <laughs>